And is it on then? Yep, it's on. All right. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're getting a whole lot of Drupal Con, Drupal GovCon here. I'm Bronius Motokaitis, known as Texas Bronius on Drupal.org, and I'm here representing Esteem Colleagues. It's a, an organization of independent consultants and others who are all working together. We're a community. Uh, we share tips. It's not just Drupal. It's all the stack. Uh, yes. Well, let me just scoot on ahead. Family man. I've got my oldest is 18, freshman in college. The others fall through. We're wearing M's for the M in esteem. Me personally, I love to run into chaos situations as an independent contractor and make sense of the situation. And so a lot of the tools we'll be talking about today are the tools I employ here. We'll talk about good ideas and best practice for smooth running pipeline. Some of the high level, and I can't help it, we'll get a little nerdy on some things as well. Uh, just a quick show, who identifies more as manager director in this room? Okay, and about, about half, and others are developers? Okay, good, good. That's a good mix, because we'll be about that high level. Uh, for documentation, we're talking about things like initial setup, requirements, maintenance, and troubleshooting. For workflow, we're talking about uh, what workflow can do for your organization and your project's success. In code, in terms of code repository, we're talking about, it's usually going to be Git as our version control system. Uh, so we'll just say some tips and techniques about how to manage that well for everybody's benefit. Uh, we get into build tools, continuous integration, automated testing, and of course, not everything is roses all the time out of the box. So we'll talk about challenges that you may face and solutions to them with each of these points. And I hope, I hope the overarching, uh, I'll just give this a spoiler, I hope the overarching message here is how important communication is throughout a project. And, and communication is <coughs> embedded in each of these aspects here. Why do we need these tools? Uh, you might have a large project where you're needing to augment and add staff to it. You might have a long-running project. You've gone into maintenance mode and, uh, and staff changes over time because Aqua hired everybody. You might have a very complicated solution uh, where you need to add features and diagnose some trouble along the way. Well, for each of these, there's, of course, solutions. The team collaborates around a shared living single code base. I hope that's not new to anybody here. If it is, whew. Uh, so we use a single canonical code source uh, source of code. Team produces self-documenting contributions. This is where we're talking about clean code, quality commit messages, and we may actually have, we definitely actually have uh, real documentation as well. It could be simple things like a README in the repo. Uh, it could be a wiki out there, or maybe using Google the Docs or some other shared. Uh, shared repository where you have information everyone can get to and hopefully contribute to as well. And a really big question for uh, especially smaller organizations or folks who are uh, maybe, maybe startups is have you got an onboarding process? For every project you, you consider this as, a, as something new to everybody on the team. What's your onboarding process with them? Um, yeah, and if we're using familiar code base, like you could say, oh, I'm a Drupal guy. Well, you, you may know Drupal, but you may not know what kind of snakes nests you're going to step into on a given project. Mm -hmm. And one big thing, now this is about communication in particular, you really want to avoid individual assumption. Lacking communication, people are led to assume things. And it's critical to streamline toward good solutions to have good communication. We want to establish safe vulnerability. For instance, coming in late to a session and not getting tomatoes thrown at you. I appreciate that. Maybe you didn't have any tomatoes yet. Uh, and you want the staff to feel comfortable asking questions. And when the answers are given, you want to see that there's growth and demonstrated growth and that the answers are documented for the next folks. Okay, and good communication doesn't necessarily mean lots of lengthy meetings or a lot of Slack messages or whatever you're using internally for communication. 
Uh, just good communication. Again, we're going to see this thread throughout is how we interact with the code and how we interact with each other. And yes, sometimes it will be meetings. So what constitutes documentation with regard to a project pipeline? All right, I mentioned you can create, you can create a simple readme. A readme is a text file or a markdown file. It's got formatting and whatnot to it. And in a project readme, you might have the setup information of how to set up a given project's stack. Every project is going to have a different stack. And at simplest, you know, if we're talking about Drupal projects, at simplest it'll have, you know, maybe Apache or Nginx, have MySQL or Postgres, but probably most MySQL. Uh, but you might have other things like a Redis cache layer, you might have Elasticsearch for various things as it expands. Uh, and there might be other physical components out there like a whole Node.js stack that is doing uh, who knows what else and interacting with the Drupal site. Well, we want to document that in a readme so that a, a developer not familiar with the given stack can come in and just start up. Uh, I think it's probably too, too common uh, that the specifics of how to set up a project are not really well known right off the bat, not well documented. In the same set of documentation, you might point to external documentation. This could be, again, a Google Docs, very popular and easy to use. It could be a wiki. GitHub has a little wiki tab on every, every project. You could slide everything in there. Um, you would also want to document things like deployment servers. Uh, and Yes. Other things that might get documented either in the README or elsewhere, or just understood in the team, is the standards like coding standards, naming conventions, testing requirements, uh, and various things like testing requirements and code standards can be either enforced by, uh, by practice, or you could have tools that enforce them, maybe things that prevent your contributors from actually merging code until it's, uh, until it's considered compliant. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. I highly recommend using single sign-on for any kind of access to uh, secure things like security credentials. You might have a password vault, uh, or you know, using uh, secrets on the in the. Uh, well, let's just say you've got passwords to things. Keep it secure, of course, but you want to be able to share it with your team. And if you're sharing, I would recommend doing it under some single sign-on thing because people come and people go, getting a person ramped up quicker. If you have them through single sign-on, you can get them access to everything very quickly. And in a, in a horrible situation, if the person needs to leave uh, unexpectedly, you want to be able to disable access to all of that right away. A single sign-on, of course, uh, helps to achieve that. Yes, and, uh, and I want to also mention that in this documentation, if you know of certain pitfalls, things that people are used to running into or you know somebody who's been there for 15 years is like oh yeah watch out for that this is the uh, sort of the here be dragons that nerds like to talk about and that usually gets a little chuckle out of people right on continuing with requirements part of documentation the requirements are clearly documented as they arise and as they evolve some of this serves for onboarding and often it's helpful for context switching when you have good requirements at your fingertips. Some of the things to include in the requirements are project overview or purpose, I'm oh, sorry, project overview, purpose, the users and the admins it serves. So you want to know your stakeholders and the people you can talk to about various aspects when you need to <coughs> refine the requirements. And uh, maybe it's uh, this is all wrapped under the quote unquote project, project charter. When you have a feature, um, you know, of course, it's common to call them stories or, or not necessarily issues, maybe tickets. Uh, when you have features, they don't need to retell everything, but they absolutely should have some context. Have you ever seen a feature where it's just like, you know, add this, you know, what am I adding it to? If you're dealing with many projects, it really helps to have the specific context of, uh, of where what needs to be done. In Agile, some feature cards are just a small sliver of functionality. Uh, of a greater feature set and a greater feature request. So you want to include an absolute, what we call a definition of done, so that 
the developer knows exactly what to work on. The developer feels confident this is the work that has been done. And if you have a QA or a product owner or somebody who's looking over this, they want to be able to say, yes, this is in fact what we agreed would be done for this particular body of work. When you're tracking bugs, bugs should describe what should happen, what is happening instead because of the bug. And it should include <coughs> should include both steps to reproduce, meaning the developer can walk through and say, oh yeah, I see this bug is happening. And when they've finished working on the bug, they can step through the steps and say, oh yeah, this is not happening anymore. And it's helpful to have specific example accounts or data in the bug story to see the bug in action and confirm once it's resolved. Somebody can say, oh, this thing isn't working, but the developer goes in and says, oh, it's working for me. Well, maybe they didn't have the specific user. A specific user might have a specific role or lack a specific role. There's all kinds of reasons that it could be, so it's very helpful to have your specific use case where the issue occurs. You've written beautiful software, it's now in maintenance and troubleshooting, or if we're talking MVP where you've already released some version of it or a prototype, now we're heading into both maintenance and ongoing development. Uh, sometimes there are periodic maintenance requirements for a document. You want to document who needs to update what and when. So this is something like, uh, I'm thinking of data that needs to change. You might need to upload, this could be a content person, you might need to upload a, a particular updated form every year, let's say, or, uh, or every year, <laughs> maybe there's HTML footer, might say 2021 for instance, you need to call a developer in there to fix it. Well, if this is something you have to do every year, you put that in your maintenance document. You put it on a schedule, put it on a calendar, it could be daily, weekly, monthly. There might be somebody who has to go and clear the cache every week. I don't know. Hopefully we're not there. And as the project evolves and is in service, it can be helpful to track common error states and workarounds and fixes. For this, I really like to capture the entire error message. So if a person sees an error on the screen, or if a person sees an error in the log, if you capture that specific thing, then when somebody else comes across this error in the future, they can say, oh, let me search for that specific search string. You know, it might be a particular database error or something. By the way, I've seen a whole lot of generic exception handlers in, uh, in Drupal or in other projects where it's really unclear, really unclear where the error occurred. It's great to put your little console message or something that logs. If you can put in any hint as to where the error occurred, that's much more helpful. Even if it's a thing like user registration colon blah blah blah, if the same message user registration colon blah blah, blah appears five times in the same code, you're like, okay, well, which one of these user registrations? So user registration email failed to <coughs> something. User registration something else happened. If you can make the static part of your error message really clear, it's much easier to find in code where the error happened. And you want to keep in mind that documentation is not just for you. Uh, and yourself in six months, but for you know, new folks coming on board. Uh, it should, oh, ha, huh, this is really important too. Your documentation should not be so detailed and so time bound that it in and of itself becomes a maintenance project or becomes stale and useless. When we talk about workflow in development, Development workflow describes how changes are introduced into the software system. From tracking the idea or bug to development to release and on into maintenance. In order to maintain sanity, predictability, and demonstrate progress. I'm a bit of a wordsmith, I apologize, it's been a while. Uh, in order to maintain sanity, it's important for an individual contributor and an entire team to understand the team's prescribed or agreed upon workflow. Without an agreed upon workflow, developers and even stakeholders may make live adjustments to the production environment, either through configuration changes. Have we seen that? Somebody goes into the server and, you know, oh, I need to add, add more uh, virtual RAM to this because it keeps crashing. Well, they might make changes to the actual server in live environment, or you might, if it's a Drupal site, maybe someone goes in and makes a view or makes tweaks to a view, maybe changes the send to email address. Well. These things can be very beneficial to go in there and do it real in real time live, but uh, it's very important then to have part of your workflow, a way to document and capture those changes, or preferably actually 
capture them into code so that in the next release of code, your, all your uh, configuration changes <coughs> won't get lost with another change. Workflows range from optionally documented and informally practiced to contractually documented and enforced by tools and or management. Since we are talking about Drupal here at Drupal GovCon, a typical Drupal workflow, as with many software projects, begins with tracking bugs and is as issues and ideas and features as stories or cards in a project management system like Jira, Trello, or even if you have to, it could be something like a cloud-based shared spreadsheet. The idea is just to have one single source of truth that everyone can get to. The project board should be shared and accessible by the team and should follow a given change request from idea, completion, uh, idea to completion and updating the state of that story along the way. It becomes the canonical source of truth, capturing and describing the idea with screenshots, refining into actionable steps, and clearly describing this standalone body of works definition of none. Ideally, a contractor can read a single story at a time, understand what to do, and confidently mark the story as done uh, when the product owner is ready to test the change. Uh, it's important if you're working with, well, it's important to separate out environments. To maximize developer freedom and minimize risk by separating out environments for different purposes, an environment refers to a part of or the whole software solution running in isolation. Here we're talking about the dev, the QA, uh, the production environment. And the idea is that changes in one environment don't affect another. And even in a development environment, if you've ever worked with a shared development environment, some remote spot there, you don't want Sally to commit something and then Johnny to commit something that breaks what Sally was working on. Maybe QA is like really confused what the state of that environment is in. Uh, it's something to note back on the previous, when we we're talking about tracking bugs and whatnot, it's very helpful to, well, it's necessary to say in which environment this particular bug was saw, was seen. Is it a production live burning bug or is it something that was in development and something that hasn't even been released yet? Mark that environment in the story. Now, we're talking government here, so this could be a little bit controversial in some cases, and I understand that the government has solutions for this as well, but developers work most freely in a local development environment. And here we're talking about, again, either a part of or the entire software solution running on the developer's laptop or desktop, whatever they're using. I understand that government can issue uh, personal development environments as necessary, and, well, a lot of folks cringe at that. I heard some stories. The idea here is that any resources the site uses can be either mocked up or stood up locally, or others can be remotely accessible from the local environment. The developers should be able to make and test changes in real time without affecting any other developers and without waiting for data and code deployments. With a working local environment, a developer can more easily troubleshoot and debug without affecting remote production data and can walk running code and inspect and manipulate compiled code and running variables with debugging tools like xdebug. And I'll give you a little hint on how to set up xdebug later. If you've not seen xdebug in motion and you're uh, in action and you're a developer, you will see uh, it gives you this insight into the running mechanism, pausing, starting, stopping, adjusting variables on the fly. Uh, very useful and something very difficult to do or much more difficult to do in a remote environment where others are looking over. Developers are also known to try and experiment and break things along the way. It's very helpful to work locally for this. Um, when working locally, depending on the software solution, it's really important to really mimic the specific uh, running environment out there. So we said Drupal, okay, so it's Drupal 7, Drupal 8, Drupal 9, 10. But maybe even the PHP version, we know we just went through a big change from PHP 7 to 8. That broke a bunch of stuff. It's really important to run exactly what you're running locally. Uh, 
Let me give you a little tip I picked up along the way. Make no assumptions over anybody, especially if you're working remotely, uh, and especially overseas. They may have, somebody may have underpowered hardware out there, and I found this up the hard way. It was about a week of us going back and forth and back and forth, why they couldn't turn on this very simple local dev environment. And it turns out that, well, they had really underpowered machines, and there was not great communication coming back to say, you know, here's something we're struggling with. I'll just skip along that. Uh, so make no assumptions about uh, your team's hardware. Know your stack and know your tools. This is, uh, l let me throw some words. I've got to hurry along here. I'll throw two words at you. If you have not heard of DDEV or you've not heard of Lando, please look into Lando. It's oh, not, not between the two, but Lando is one I'm most familiar with. It makes it super simple to set up everything we were just talking about, the entire stack with the specific versions of PHP, MySQL. If you know Docker, okay, you're, you're fine as well. But Lando just makes it super simple. Put that in the, in the uh, repo with everyone else. They can all work on the same exact uh, system you're working on. Uh, and at the last minute, I really wanted to throw in this comment about silos. I heard a talk yesterday, and it's when you're working in uh, your local environment, it can be very tempting to just take your workload and chop away at it, but this really risks you working in a silo. When you or any of your team members are in a silo, nobody knows what the person's working on. You can get into big trouble this way because, uh, well, you can imagine. If you're expecting some amount of work to be done, and there's no communication on it, you don't know if the person's struggling, could use help, or is completely lost, or incompetent. So one of the little... Uh, tips here was, hey, just start your working branch and push the stuff remotely, even if it's not ready for review or anything along those lines. Yes, with Drupal, so much is handled in the database. Uh, this is, you know, again, creating views, creating entities and all this. Well, how do you share those things? Drupal has a built-in way for sharing those as configuration changes in code. We know the developer has complete freedom in their own development environment to manipulate database tables, clicking around in the admin UI, building these configurations, but you wanna make sure that that stuff gets captured in a, what's called a configuration export. And there are some challenges with sharing configuration exports with others in the team. They're frequently very large chain sets and if anyone else is working in configuration exports as well, you want to be able to pull in your team's configuration changes and not lose your own. So the idea here is to push out, push out frequently, uh, share your changes, and in some cases, you might run into merge conflicts with code. Well, all the configuration changes are YAML files, or text files, and they're fairly human adjustable. You can look at them and surgically put them together. But to avoid those merge conflicts, it's most beneficial to export and push frequently. Gosh, I feel like I'm really pressed for time here, so I'm really gonna scoot along. Does anyone see anything here they just wanna me to feel into in particular? All right. Merge yes. constant problem. <laughs> oh man, yes. Okay, so I talked about configuration merge conflicts. Another you'll run into big time is uh, with composer lock files. Uh, I think I have that on my next guy. <coughs> Maybe I don't. Okay, so composer, composer lock. One quick tip I found is that you can sort of speculate. This is a little controversial. You can speculatively introduce modules into a project by adding it to composer, push it out there, you know, merge that to main. It's not going to cause any harm to have a module that's not enabled, but it'll be in there and composer will be there. The composer lock will be there. It's all fresh for whoever's at, whoever else is adding modules. So you'll just reduce the amounts of merge conflicts you might introduce. Uh, something else you can do is just blow away the composer lock file, rebuild your thing, but then you might get some new updates to other modules. Yes? One thing we found that works really well is a designated driver. So one person's composer. Oh, man. If you want, you want a module, <laughs> go to that person. They throw it in. They push it in, it gets merged. There's no merge conflicts coming out of the closer. Okay, yeah, you could do that. The, the sort of the captain, captain of the ship, yeah. I, I would just throw one little thing. As long as that person's not committing directly to main or master every time. Oh, no, that's no, so no, frustrating. No. <laughs> a lot of long vacations. 
Oh, that's right. If a person's not available, then you gotta designate a new captain. Okay. Let me uh, see where we are here. Are we generally familiar with code repositories, branching solutions? Yeah? I hope. Okay, well, I'll just say this, that you really want to maintain a, a single, always production-ready branch, whether you're actually uh, pushing to production or not regularly. Uh, the point is you have your working feature branches, working bug branches. If you have a long-running feature set and you want to put it into a release branch, you can do that as well. Put that on the side, merge that frequently from the features. The issue comes up when you have what's called a hot fix, some bug that's burning and really needs to be fixed. Okay, you'll work against the master branch, or the main branch, but you will also want that hotfix to go to the uh, release branch as well. Uh, so that when the release comes in, it's a, the, as you're hardening the release, you, you, you know you're working with what's closest to production. Uh, boy. Guys, I'm sorry, I'm cooking along now. Um, coding standards, have we talked about that yet? We have not. Coding standards. I'll just put a quick note in here. There are established coding standards across all the various code bases. Drupal has its own as well. You really want your IDE to enforce these. Uh, the idea is that you have proper tab and uh, sorry space indentions or tabs, depending on what, what you agree upon, and your whole team is using exactly the same formatting. You want your code to look clean, and if you have things like naming conventions, you want to make sure that's enforced as well. And you can use your ID to enforce these rules. That's what I've got to say about that. I really want to talk about pull requests. So the idea behind pull requests is okay. Pull request. Uh, let's let's go free form here. The idea of a pull request is that uh, a developer has been working on a given feature set. They think it's beautiful. They've run it through all the code cleaning. They've done everything they can do. And they say, I'm ready to merge this back into the main branch and contribute it back into the main project. Well, it's very important at this point then to introduce a pull request. A pull request is a chance for a, another team member. It could be a peer. It could be a manager. It could be a senior developer to come and look at that pull request, compare to the story, compare to the code, make sure it follows all the organization standards and is ready to merge into and push the request out. If it's not, then it's a chance for the conversation to happen. Go back and forth on that with a pull request and make some additional changes, update it until it's ready. If something drastically changes in the process, you can close the pull request, throw it away, start a new one, and nothing has broken in the, uh, in the main branch from there. The pull request review is when another team member acts as a gateway for merging that pull request. Um, oh, yes, are there any failing tests? There are a lot of things a person can look for in a pull request review. If there's no time for a full, full pull request review, at least a cursory glance at it can help prevent some certain errors before moving on. But sometimes we just need to push and change and push and change. So once we're ready to push and change, we merge this feature request into the main branch and your change set is now available to other team members. This is where we get into those merge conflicts. Again, other team members, when they pull down the main branch, they will have your changes with them. You might have some overlapping features in what you're working on locally when you pull in someone else's work. This is where, again, either merge conflicts or worse, Configuration changes can get lost, so you want to be either in good communication or read the recent requests that came in. And in the pull request, you want to also put some information about safely deploying this change. Uh, here we're talking about things like enabling and disabling modules on the production database upon release. Uh, if you can't if you can't write in a particular, like a mini migration where you're updating, you've got update hooks in Drupal. If you can't work out something, you at least need to communicate with the release manager or if you're the one yourself, have specific steps for deployment, what you need to click around in the, in the Drupal UI upon release. Uh, 
to avoid fires. And on to automated build tools and automated tests. Build tools and automated tests automate the process of compiling source code into executable units for test and deployment. Build tools ensure consistent, reproducible builds, reducing the risk of issues in com as compared with manual deployment. And they build, and when you build before deployment, so that deployment task becomes just like flipping a switch. Also, rollbacks should be easier with this system. Automated, automated builds may take time to execute, but they save staff hours and reduce human error, making code more efficient, making builds more efficient. And the build process can be as complex or as simple as the software requires it. One of the benefits here is you can put in automated tests. Automated tests run little snippets of code throughout the project and confirm that in the greater body of all the released code, all those previously known working tests are still passing. Now, nothing's been released to production yet, so the automated build tests, if they fail here, it's a win. It's a chance to go back and uh, see exactly what has changed, what regressions have been introduced into the system. Uh, other things that can go wrong is third-party dependencies. When you when you build fresh each time from your composer and composer lock, you might get some new dependency you didn't know was coming in, and something might break. Also, it's a win that it breaks during during uh, release uh, before release in this sense. Uh, they can also be slow to develop these tests. But if it's if you're working in test-driven development, for instance, then building these tests is automatically part of your workflow. Uh, you may, may have seen automated tests on little unit tests. There is also the ability to do uh, basically, uh, I forget what you call it, this running a virtual DOM. It spins up the entire system and it's as if there's a web browser rendering this application and literally the automated test is clicking, clicking, clicking and seeing the results of things by reading HTML returned or DOM manipulations. And these are really slow tests, but they're really helpful if pixel precision is necessary. Yes. I just wonder, do you have any suggested recommendation for the automated testing tool module? Yes. Let me throw that at the end. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll say that, yeah, I'm definitely just going overview, and there's a ton of stuff out there, but I'll tell you about some personal experiences, yeah. Okay, yeah, um, here we were just talking about. Jeez, I'm so sorry, folks. We're all watching the time, right? Really pinched. Okay, we'll just go into questions. <laughs> Let's do it that way. Um, you were saying specific tools for automated tests. Uh, what do you have in mind? Nothing in mind because okay. I know we need to have better QA. I can't rely on a uh, developer slash tester to do this kind of thing. Yeah. By okay. Okay. So um, this is everything from you know old school. There's Selenium. It's a browser plugin. You can run those kinds of things. Uh, but if you really want to automate it, I'm drawing a complete blank of specific names. PHP unit. Well, yes, for PHP unit. I think we're talking though, are you talking after about like the, the yeah, after I think functional testing, mm -hmm. like GUI based, right? After yeah. the, the we, we implemented it on this uh, with Selenium using Java web browser. So we have uh, begun almost like 400 test cases creating content. I think content that has been like a test Cypress. Cypress, thank you. Yes, is a good one. Yes. For visual regression backstop. Or? Well, let's let's talk about this one. Raj, you said the uh, you said Java and Selenium. So this yes. is kind of a home ruled yeah. thing, and it runs on its own. Ah, yeah. with the I mean, like Jenkins job, it takes like a couple of hours. Like, yeah, yeah. 
and, and we've got Cypress is a really neat one. It's uh, JavaScript, based, JavaScript, and you can do the whole assertions instead of things. But it's but it's, it's being used. In, the reason why I mentioned it is it's now being used in Core. Is it along with Nightwatch? Yeah. Okay, tell us more. I don't. Oh, that's. <laughs> I just saw the change record go by and said, "Oh, look." Okay. So Core, Drupal Core itself has its own yeah. built-in test, of course, and apparently it's using Cypress as well, which does all the clicking around in the, in the virtual browser, but you can implement Cypress on your own, uh, on your own, you don't need to rerun all the core stuff, probably, hopefully, <laughs> uh, but for your particular, yes? Anyone have the 